famous person who say no, no need no need of introduction but in this case uh, I think that that's applies totally so John is extremely famous in this audience so <laughs> no need of introduction um, so I'm very proud to be here uh, thank you very much for the for the invitation and nice to see you all the people that old friends and uh, people that were my my um, my professors and uh, my colleagues <laughs> very happy to be here and then I just give the floor to, to Joan because all of us came to to listen Joan so thank you Joan for giving this lecture. I'm going to put some music. Can I speak Catalan? No. 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 No, nosotros no, pero aún es cuando. Pues eso es una presentación, o sea, sigui, estoy presentando dos libros que no existen. Un que es diu, ¿cómo se llama? No existen en casa. Aquí esta es la cubierta de aquel libro de Springer que presenta unos cuantos artículos sobre esta anomenada Escuela de Economía Ecológica y Ecología Política de Barcelona, que es un título, yo pienso ahora una mica dubtós, porque a dicta hay gente que hace otras cosas, Ecología Industrial, y a Isabel Angelowski, que no es, pero que hace Justicia Ambiental Urbana, y a mucha otra gente, que no siente ningún malamente porque he puesto este título, ya no? El que digo tiene un mérito porque la economía ecológica y la ecología política no es seguro que existen en cara a muchas universidades del mundo, no hay cap departamento de eso. Cap... En general, eso es diu de Environmental Social Sciences y podríamos decir de Environmental Humanities, no sé si Marco Armiero es, es aquí el que incluye la historia ambiental, no? Environmental Social Sciences en Environmental Humanities, que es diferente una amiga, los que hacen oceanografía y cambio climático, etc. Y eso es lo que ya que digo. Y eso, el otro libro no publica, que es aquel, pero que sí que está aceptado para publicar y que es diu de esta manera. Y que surtirá, no sé cuándo, aquí seis meses, puse y que es lo que explicaré ahora. No sé si puse algo y escucha que eso avance. Y aquí este libro, como explico aquí, es una contribución, acabo de explicar yo, a las environmental social sciences. Y lo que digo aquí este libro, lo que pregunta aquí este libro, es si hay un movimiento global de justicia ambiental. A ver si tengo una discusión sobre un anal al món, el colapso, o con Brasil se escapa de Bolsonaro, que hay que ver para si se la, la prórroga de él, y todos los desastres que pasan. Pues yo creo que la historia tiene un sentido, eso es una hipótesis, la historia tiene un sentido y puede mejorar, puede ir bien, ¿no? No sé, no tengo que este optimismo, pero quizás porque va a ser el año 1939 y realmente una vez va a ser el año 1939 y va a ser el año 1939 y va a haber bombas atómicas y todo, ¿no? Quizás tornará, ¿eh? Porque en realidad no retorno es eso. Pero yo creo que la historia, que me da fue esta hipótesis que la historia tiene un sentido y que hace este sentido por sí que para la justicia, que para la, la mejora de las cosas. La bolsa que el libro está basado en la que alas que fue, como el sumiseo, y que está en la mica turata, ahora, pero que te lo han llegado y que es sobre conflictos ambientales. Y vamos a que Libra habla de geografías de resistencia a diversos blocos geográficos, no todo el mundo, pero el arte, Japón, China, una mica, la India y también algunas regiones, el este y el sur de la India, África, 
jocs d'Àfrica, no tota d'Àfrica, i Amèrica sí, a més, no sí, jocs d'Europa. Però a més té capítols transversals que ensenyaré sobre diverses qüestions. Qui són els protagonistes de l'ecologisme popular, l'ecologisme dels pobres i dels indígenes, o l'ecologisme de la classe subalterna, això ho discutiré una mica més, com dir-li aquest moviment global de justícia ambiental. I també parla d'algunes mercaderies, i també parla d'això que s'ha explicat abans en una altra sessió, de la business ecològica en econòmics, Ecologische Betriebswirtschaft, en alemany, que és on s'ha inventat això, i com podem contribuir des de l'estudi dels conflictes, també comerç internacional i també un capítol sobre l'augment de la població. O millor dit, jo crec que l'augment de la població humana s'ha aturat. Ja no creix més o molt poquet, em sembla bé, però faig una mica d'història d'això. I també aquesta qüestió dels llenguatges d'avaluació. Tot va bé? Ho enteneu tots? No, enteneu el que posa aquí, però si no ho enteneu. Estem fent dues coses. L'altra és classe de català. Jason Picker, per instance. Jo l'any que he dit, l'any que he dit, l'any que he dit, l'any que he dit, Why are there so many environmental conflicts? Well, are there so many environmental conflicts? This could be discussed, but we're not going to discuss this. And one, one view of looking at this is to go back to the principles of ecological economics, or to the beginning of ecological economics, and to the book by Jutesco Regan of uh, 51 years ago, and to show that, of course, the world economy is not circular at all, it is really entropic, and there are some calculations that did not exist at the time of Jutesco Reagan, or even myself, or Herman Gehry, who died recently, and which come from this group in Vienna doing uh, counting the material flows. I know that one ton of plutonium, as is Jean Pietro here, is not the same as a ton of sun, but if we see the trend, the trend has been going up on the amount of materials, including the energy materials, of course, which are extracted, And now it's a coincidence, it's about 100 uh, billion tons, gigatons per year, probably in 2022 will be increasing a little bit. And of these, only or less than 10 gigatons are recycled, a lot of it becomes stocks of materials like this university, which won't last forever, fortunately, because architecture is uh, not, not the best in the world but it's going to last still some years, but then it becomes waste, isn't it? But, no, waste, uh, material waste. And also the, ener the energy coming to the economy is not recycled, and uh, many other things are recycled only to a small extent, like aluminium, or copper, and so on. So less than 10% of, of these gigatons coming to the economy is recycled, this what we mean, by saying that the economy is entropic, and what I have done, thought myself, I don't know whether anybody else has thought about this in the same way, this is the cause, the material cause of so many environmental conflicts. From the extraction, but also from the waste. For instance, the waste, which is the excessive amount of carbon dioxide. So, John Peter was talking before a little bit against input output views. But this is what I'm explaining now, an input-output view of what enters into the economy and what goes out and becomes carbon dioxide or other waste and is not recycled. And this, of course, is the killing curve, which was mentioned before. And as you know, I'm sorry, it's only until May, but it's going up, you can be sure that it's going up very regularly. In Peter, as before, it was linear. Yeah, I think it's linear, but perhaps a little bit more than linear, isn't it? It's very alarming. So you, the young people in the room, are going to see, certainly, this reaching 450 parts per million, in about 20 or 30 years more, and there is nothing which is going to stop, as I said. Not Kyoto, not uh, the next one, so 
this is the, the reality. <laughs> so it's not surprising, because this surprised me to read this again recently, that you just could already in 1975, although he was not emphasizing the, the carbon dioxide, he was emphasizing the exhaustion, no? oil, peak oil, this kind of thing. But he wrote this in a footnote to his article in 75, that you can read. That greenhouse effect, and he already he wrote this, he published this, also in Spanish, in El Trimestre Economico, in Mexico, in this article called Energy and Economic Need, and perhaps in many other places. So he knew this second hand, because he was not a scientist of climate change. He was already known, of course, in the 70s and in the 80s, but this was known already at the beginning of the 20th century, and the quality is not very good, but this comes from a newspaper in New Zealand, which took it from the press agency, and it says that the furnaces of the world are burning now 2 billion tons of coal. Well, now it's, this year is not 2 billion tons of coal, it's 8 billion tons of coal, plus oil, plus gas. Okay? And this, when this is burned, it will match with oxygen and produces carbon dioxide, and this tends to make the air a more effective blanket. Very nice work, isn't it? So this is not the greenhouse effect, this is the blanket effect, isn't it? Of the blanket is another metaphor, isn't it? For the so. And the end says, this will be a threat in a few centuries, <laughs> but it's already a threat now. So the, the whole argument in the book is this, the metabolism of society and the environmental conflict or the changes in the metabolism of society and the conflicts are two sides of the same coin, as the world wrote recently in an article of Mexico. And then this we know about the conflicts because we have been doing these others, filling in data sheet, which we copied more or less with Lea Templar and Daniel Elbeni and the people who started the others of the 10 years ago, but we improve on it and so on. So I see this because I am also like a social historian, or economic historian. So since this data are a bit outdated already, the entries in the others, I have an excuse, and they call it an archive for environmental history, isn't it? Although we would like to, uh, to update them all the time, but it's quite impossible, because we have almost 4,000 entries in the others. But it's not only a joke to call it uh, so, uh, an archive. It will be very useful in future as an archive. And many of these conflicts have finished already. For instance, the Rio Tinto conflict in Andalusia in 1888, when Rio Tinto and the military killed about 200 people in a copper mining conflict, this case was very ended long time ago. Of the Rio Tinto, of course, has other conflicts. And there is a map of the, 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 the Alvas, and this is what is in the book. I selected about 500 conflicts. Uh, I selected those that I myself have been involved in writing about them, or moderating them, correcting them and also according to my own taste, and of course there is a collective work of entering all these conflicts in which, I don't know, the, the person years, I calculate this into perhaps 30 person years or something of work for the others, isn't it? Of course, some people like Daniel Elvene more person years than other people, but many people have uh, collaborated to the others, and you are welcome to cooperate with the others, very welcome. If you make some entries to the others, then you will get some points from the <laughs> <laughs> History will remember you. <laughs> and this is the type of context. Then we come to this introductory 
uh, I cannot explain everything because it's a long, a long book, it's about 800 pages going to be. So some publishers said it's too long to cut it into like in, the, in a chicken shop, you can cut it. And I refused to do it and finally I had managed to print, uh, the book will be printed all of it with figures and maps and everything. And this is the part, the first part. So I start with the East, Japan, the Philippines, and there are some transversal concepts, like the fourth concept is about women, environmental, uh, who are victims, assassinated, of course, helped a lot by Dalena Tran, who is here, finishing a thesis on this topic in this uh, institute. <coughs> but this was already half written at the beginning, five years ago, after uh, Berta Cáceres was here. So I think the transversal chapters are more interesting in a way, but I didn't think about this at the beginning. And one could write a book like this totally with transversal chapters across cities. So I know somebody who's not here who is writing a book about Mexican environmental conflicts, and I'm trying to convince her to do it like this, just transversal across the geographies of Mexico, but also to look at some geographies, some countries or some subcontinents, it's interesting. So for instance, for East Africa, I think Dr. Brockington is here. Well, I know something about Kenya because I've been in Kenya a few weeks, some years ago and so on, but um, Southeast Africa I know, South Africa also I know, and the Gulf of Guinea I know, meaning that I have visited as an ecotourist, more or less, looking at disasters, but I don't really know them, I'm not a specialist. But um, the 14th chapter has a subtitle, we thought it was oil, but it was blood, and it comes from Nemo Base in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta, and the whole fight in the Niger Delta against the Shell company. Then it goes on like this. The chapter 15 is written together with Arpita Beach from India. Um, and we're publishing an article now, very soon, in Extractive Industries and Societies, but the chapter was already written. So if I wait two, three years more, everything will become articles with other people, and then the book will not be able to be published. So they have this working class environmentalist, which I thought about before, but then and Greta Nava wrote an article about injustice, religious groups, and never thought they would write about religious groups, but they appear in the others, Buddhist groups or uh, liberation theology groups in, in Latin America, Buddhist groups in some parts of Asia, or just uh, local religions. And this, of course, the protagonist of the conflicts are in terms of religious values. They say, this lake is sacred, but sacred, I suppose, could not some kind of religion, isn't it? Not everything that is sacred, for instance, in India, water could be sacred from a Hindu, from a Hindu, from a Brahmanic point of view, excluding the Dalits, isn't it? So not everything that is religious is good. In fact, religion is usually very bad for people in my own view. But there are some exceptions, like when religion is using, for instance, in Tibet, against my name, uh, <coughs> near monasteries and so on. If you want more anecdotes, I can see more because the whole book is full of anecdotes. Each of these chapters has subsections and has like 10 or 12 or 15 pages. Also, a um, uh, uh, chapter, I am, well, I'm happy with all of them, but the Iberian Peninsula I had to put because people ask me all the time, what about Catalonia, why there are no more cases? And so we have a chapter on the Iberian Peninsula looking at transborder conflicts with Portugal, the rivers and the eucalyptus and so on. And also the last chapters are more theoretical because I think that a lot of these conflicts, as Armin has shown in one or two articles now, looking at the whole Anders and publish one in Global Environmental Change and another perhaps coming in another very well-known journal soon. Looking at the protagonists in the Anders or some of the sources uh, who are from indigenous people. 
this Vicky uh, Reyes is here, some people who know more, and I don't know whether Yamazar is himself is here, yes. So there is the anthropologist bench here in the second <laughs> row, and they're watching what I say. And so, <laughs> but I think that the indigenous people are protagonists of these conflicts uh, for the reason that they live at the commodity extraction frontiers. In the last part, they have been pushed there, they, would, they were already there, or they have been pushed there, and also because I think there is an indigenous revival in the world, as we all know, for instance, also Matthew Ortas here, from the fact, I, I remember the first times I went to, to Peru many years ago, every, all the indigenous people in the Amazon were called Campa. And then Stefano Varesa wrote a book saying they are not Campa, they are Ashanka. And now we have Ashanka, Ashuar, Shuar, many names of people who have the names have revived because there is an attempt to revive socialism. And this is linked to the presence of 40% of indigenous people in the 40% of the conflicts in the Andes and in the book also have indigenous people as protagonists, where in the world the indigenous people as, I don't know who classifies people as indigenous, so for instance Catalans, I speak in English, no? No. Uh, <laughs> Catalans are not indigenous, no? Some Catalans look almost indigenous, <laughs> but, <laughs> but not a Barcelona bourgeois intellectual, it doesn't sound indigenous Catalan, or does it, I don't know. We are not justified as Catalans, as indigenous. <laughs> so, but it's, without jokes, it's very important, I think, this presence of socially weak people with power, but who fight in terms of Convention Cut 69 of Iro, or the forest right action in India, and so on. And so I go on. Chapter 26 is about international trade, comes straight from Wallerstein. And, and from this school of world systems, world system theory, dividing between commodities, between preciosities and bulk commodities. Preciosities means gold and diamonds, except that now some of the elements for industry, like palladium and so on, cobalt, they come in small quantities and they are very expensive. So this difference between bulk commodities, cheap and bulky, and preciosities is a bit fishy, so I explain all this with examples with jade, for instance, and other preciosities, but also this kind of uh, elements now for the, for the electrical revolution, and so on. So I explain it a little bit more. So the, the last chapter makes this question, which you need to, since we are here with, uh, among friends and colleagues, and the university is uh, place where we should not tell lies. Uh, I don't know whether there is a global movement of environmental justice, but it is what I want to show, that there is one uh, movement or several movements for environmental justice. No? So the subtitle of the book is The Making of World Movements for Environmental Justice. The thing of the making comes, as many or some of you will, dictator will remember, comes from E.P. Thompson's book, The Making of the English Working Class. I'm not going to explain this in the book because it's a bit presumptuous, isn't it? But this is where I got the idea of the making of World Movement for Environment. E.P. Thompson is a very thick book, only for one class, social class, the working class, and only from one country, which is not even a country, England. And England and Wales, actually. So this is what justifies the length of the book. And this leads me to social movement theory, because in fact I have been held by this Balzan Prize recently, given indirectly by Donatella de la Porta, who influenced the jury. I understand, it's a secret, but... <laughs> and, then, and she's a theorist of social movement theory, uh, Italian, Donatello della Porta, with Mario Diani, and so on. And I think that the book, apart from being ecological economics, because I look at conflicts born from the changes in the 
metabolism of society, which is ecological economics or industrial ecology, and also the fights about valuation languages, no? incommensurability of language or valuation, which is ecological economics. I also look at political ecology, which means how power is deployed in this kind of conflicts. But I also look, or I also contribute, I think, or we do, the others, all of us, to the theory of social movements, the theory of social movements. And so, uh, people like Donatello de la Porte and so on, they are a bit like entomologists in a way, social entomologists. They look social movements and they don't care professionally about the content of the movement, whether they are on the side of history or against history, assuming this means anything. I think that we are on the side of history doing the others, I hope. Now history has to follow what we do. <laughs> I never said this before, but they think. Uh, but they, they, as I said, they classify. They don't care whether it's a movement for a feminist movement, which is really on the side of history. One can show this, one can lift this. Uh, or other kind of movements, which could be the Bolsonaro, the, the fascist movement, or even non-political movements, the movement or social movement of chess players or whatever. This is what they do, and they, and well, we use this kind of literature to explain this kind of uh, uh, social movement of environmental justice, which the others, of course, this was born, as we said in the previous session, the name environmental justice in that sense, a movement was born in the US in the 80s from the civil rights movement. But in the US, as I explained in one of the chapters, in chapter 24, it's become a little bit parochial. If there are people, American people, it would be nice to discuss this because they focus on minorities. And minorities in the US, a very strange word, minorities meaning black people, indigenous people, Latino people who are already 60% of the people perhaps, but they call themselves minorities and this book is about majorities, it's not the 99%, but it's about many people in Europe who are on the losing side in the ecological distribution conflicts. And in the US I think that there is also political reason why the, the very good, interesting and more than totally in favor movement which proclaimed the 17th principle of environmental justice in Washington DC in 1991 in a solemn assembly of leaders of people of color. Uh, this was the time of, well, after Martin Luther King and so on. They proclaimed these principles which are very valid and they talk about the waves and other forms of life and it's not ethnocentric, it's not American only. But on the other hand, they have never talked about what the U.S. is doing outside the U.S. For instance, the Chevron case in Ecuador, which is really a travesty of justice from an American company, Texaco Chevron, they have never gone into this. I think they, they, well, they have enough in their place isn't it, to start criticizing American companies and American imperials. So, uh, but the origin of all this comes from this movement, the origin of the words environmental justice, not as a part of moral philosophy, but as a part of social, uh, of sociology or social history, comes from the estate Bullard, the author Bullard, Paul Mohai, who has contributed to the others a lot, uh, uh, Pedro in, in California, and so on. So, going back to this, how are we going to explain what the less and what are you, which I never read before, they use this word disomatic. The, the, the main point I want to make is the last one at the end. Organizations are not a requirement for social movements to exist. The movements for, for environmental justice have no politburo and no central committee, and, but they exist, isn't it? I'll, I'll talk more about this. If you disagree, it would be better for the discussion. And one example of this kind of movement, a very important example, is the feminist movement. And I read not long ago this book by Lucy Delap from Cambridge, which is called like a social history 
of feminists around the world, including Iran before the recent events, including Arab countries around the world. Of course, starting with the suffragettes and these European things, but going around the world. And I think the feminist movement really exists and is growing and is like a model of lack of organization or organization, this somatic organization. And you can go to Argentina and say, who are, who, who are the feminists doing? Well, we know what they are doing recently, isn't it? And what are they, do, what are they now suffering in the US? All these questions have make sense, have sense. People understand what you are talking about. And you don't, have, you don't need to know who is the, the head of this movement. And any head it has, well, people die after some years, isn't it? So new ones come and they continue. And the environmental movement, something of this might happen, for instance, Friends of the Earth is perhaps what is nearer to uh, an environmentalist international, uh, but it's not an, first it's a confederation, it's not, there are no rules, chiefs, they are very different from different countries, and as I said before, in Argentina, for instance, what is important is something called the Asambleas de Vecinos Autoconvocadas, which is a political world born around the year 2000, for other things also, not just environmental struggles. And in Spain, clearly, with some exceptions in Catalonia, but Ecologistas in Action is the main confederation also, and they do not belong to uh, Friends of the Earth. They don't want to, they could enter any day, but some other group already occupied the slot. So, there is no environmental justice organization around the world and no good and so forth. It doesn't matter. I mean, there are common slogans, sometimes there are common types of banners. Remember, for instance, the anti nuclear movement starting in the US and in Europe in the 70s with the, the Soli Ridente in Italian and the, the Smiling Sun. I don't know who invented this, nobody here knows who invented this, isn't it? Nobody from here invented this because this was in the 70s. And so, and it's spread everywhere, almost everywhere. It's difficult to find it in China, but there are also in China demonstrations against nuclear power. And this is some of the literature. And this is something that we can take from the Atlas. And the first ones we published in, in already in 2016, and I think was already helping to do these statistics, and it was useful to get to show this to get the first big project. Well, we got two big, big projects: one called IJOT and the second one on environmental justice. After presenting this kind of statistics, and here you see from less to more the kind of groups the names that we give or have some of the, the, the people. So there are more, in many conflicts, there are more than one or two or three of these social groups. Uh, we speak as could be something that Federico de Maria has been studying all the time, because I think there are 80 something, and a book will come out or an article before 2025, 2026. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we could go on. It will be a book for each of them, isn't it? The last one called Local Environmental Justice Organizations. This is the name we give to these organizations, local ones. Many of them don't call themselves environmental justice organizations. They could be here, for instance, the Plataforma of somebody, the Coordinadora of somewhere against whatever infrastructure, and these are, you can read this. Then there is a very silly line called women, that we fail to do it properly in the schedule, because we should have a separate page and say, are women leaders in this movement? And this would have been sense, it? doesn't mean to say women, women means here women activists, active, like Dalena Tran is starting some of them. I don't know why there are so many others. Others could be journalists, could be children, somebody from China started to say, we have forgotten the children. The children are very important, and quite often children are put in the demonstrations, isn't it? 
And journalists are very important in, in China, for instance, <coughs> and other places. And this is another table of frequency, and of course one can do statistics of saying in that type of conflict, like anti-nuclear conflict, does this change the classification, or as better numbers be, when we have uh, health conflicts or, uh, or complaints against damage to human health, then the schedule of participants changes totally, and the working class and the trade unions go up, isn't it? This is an article published in Global Environmental Change, which is a very remarkable, we were all very pleased to, because of these statistics and show the consistency of the others, that the data are not, are not invented, because we can test this kind of hypothesis. Who are the protagonists depending on the conflict, or what are the forms of action, the repertoires of contention and social movements here in the uh, in the others. There are people who, uh, if you go up, uh, the financial activists uh, exist, but in very few conflicts. Very few means uh, are percentages, isn't it? So 3% of 4,000 no, is not so few, it's enough to do an article about this. And the second one is threats to use arms, or sometimes using a little bit of arms. And there are people like Alexander Dunner, who is a very prolific author, who thinks that the environmental movement is much more violent, that it is, according to us, according to the others. And also he thinks that the counter-insurgency movement from the companies is also more relevant than we say, but he has to show his evidence for this. You cannot prove this with three or four cases. Uh, it depends, of course, on the country, isn't it? And then, as you see, well, this is quite normal. Kind. There are, one could classify this form of action into two sections, those more moderate, uh, we have done this in some articles, and those more militant, more, in, in, in Colombia, they would say more berracas. There are in Colombia, berraca, in Venezuela also. But I don't know how to say this in English, more, more not violent, more, outspoken, isn't it? And it's interesting to see, to make correlations with, uh, depending on the commodities, because this is another thing about the commodities, the frequency of commodities, because all this is based in this analysis of commodities. All these conflicts come because uh, the market or the companies or, or, uh, go to the frontiers of commodity extraction to extract the commodities. Here we also, when we made the schedule, we forgot some which we should have put, like fertilizers, the big mess we made, and nickel, for instance, but we can add this later, although we change the statistics, but we can look at this into, into by what search the others, pushing a button, we, we find them, and in fact, on nickel, there is somebody from the Pompeo Public University that have used the others recently uh, for writing a very good article on nickel mining, which as you know is something going up because of the electrical transition. Uh, so these are not things that we can write about, the effects of the, of the transitions on the conflicts. Where, right? Some conflicts will go down, like coal, but they are not going down because coal extraction is going up in the world. It's still in India and China. India is in a transition to coal, as an article by Prototi Roy and Anne Arctic show that you can read. But of course, uh, nickel and copper yeah, are going up fast. Huh? So, when back it will these are some of the collective actors. We have 40 or 50 now articles published based on the others. And these are some of them, and some of the authors are here. And so this is something that uh, uh, we, we can get an application for proof of concept. Uh, those who are in the ERC kind of market will know what it means. I don't know how we even get it, because we are proving the concept by publishing articles. What else can we go? Uh, but uh, that's things that happen.
and then it's an example which I like because I could show now and there is Teresa Sanz who is now in Britain but he's doing the doctor here who is doing the iconography of environmental conflicts which for a long time I didn't even know we didn't think about iconography means the banners the slogans the films no? the murals of course any movement even the student movement, sometimes in the university they move a little bit, they don't move very much. But they move a little, and then they paint something. So now somebody painted, coming from the train from Barcelona, a small group I suppose, painted saying, Lenin is coming back. Did you see it? Well, I don't think he's coming. I hope he's not coming back soon, but... but <laughs> or perhaps he should come back, I don't know. Anyway, this shows... This iconography, like iconography is not very good. They were in a hurry, perhaps, to okay? and, and it shows something, isn't it? What does it show? You wouldn't find this in, in other places, in Oxford, for instance. <laughs> and this you find in a, in a painting in, in, in southern Italy, a movement that lost, because the, this is about gas coming from Azerbaijan, from the east, coming to Europe. It's not, that's not a state in Puglia, I'm sure the gas comes up from Italy and they were painting this and in, it in Italian they say ne qui ni altrove meaning in Catalan ni aquí ni al lloc in Catalan you can say this very briefly also which is a translation clearly of not in anyone's backyard so they were aware that they were going to be called NIMBYs and said, we are not NIMBY, we mm -hmm. are not in anyone's body. And we could find many, many, many of these kind of slogans in many languages in the others. And I think it's quite, a, for me, it's quite a new kind of research, which I'm not able to do because we need to be, uh, have, have training in interpreting the arts, isn't it? Or the humanity. So this others is also a contribution to the environmental humanities and some of the environmental social sciences. We have also this ranking of the companies in which the Chinese companies, every time we run this with more entries and more recently the Chinese companies appear more, Sino Hydro and Xinjin and so on. The, the, the graphic is not well done because First you have a column from 1 to 11, which continues here, from, from 13 to, and then, many of these companies, and then, idea of the companies, which also I have never done research on, on companies before in my life, but now it comes very easily, or somebody, you know, who thought about this, but now Daniela Del Bene wrote about, and other people, Antonio Bontempi, who is doing a thesis here, about the Impregilo Salini company in Italy, which has been built dams around the world since Giolitti, Mussolini, Democracy, uh, Berlusconi, it doesn't matter. They do this every, everywhere in Barcelona and, and some messy kind of... The Valle Company in Brazil with this famous dam, uh, waste dam failures in Mariana and Brumadinho in Minas Gerais and other disasters they make and now Marcel he, he's doing a, an article on the, on the Total company in France in France and here because I, now I get in my electricity bill comes from Total I don't know, they bought something else and now so if you are clients of Total you should watch it because Total is in the Arctic, Total is in Cabo Delgado, in Mozambique, is in many, has been in Algeria, in West Africa, and so on. And one can do, through the others, at least to get some examples, anecdotal evidence about conflicts they have around the world. And this is what I called before business ecological economics, or business political ecology, which is a promising field of study. And so this is the conclusion of the first page in the conclusions that you can already read. One important thing is who are the protagonists of the second contradiction. Many or 10, 20 years ago I wrote a book called The Environmentalists of the Poor, which is my main claim to fame. 
uh, uh, I see this in, if you look at Google Scholar and so on, for some reason is what uh, I think my first book about ecological economics was more interesting to tell the truth. But this was based very much traveling around the world and already collecting cases, but not like the others. The others are really a big tool for research and for activists, perhaps, to help people in the environmental movement. And so, and in this book, as I was joking a little bit, I call this the environmental of the poor because with Ram Gua in India, we have been fighting Ronald Ingelhardt, a famous political scientist who died a few months ago, who had been saying that the environmental movement of the 70s or 60s, 70s, 80s was a post-materialist, whatever he meant, he said was a post-materialist movement because after 68, uh, young people at least, the, the Greens in Germany perhaps, they didn't, uh, <coughs> they were not concerned about the economy, there was full employment, and so they, they became hippies, so to speak, and they uh, became green political parties. And this he called this post-materialist, meaning post-money people, post-crematistic post people, but not post-materialist, because the complaints in Germany, for instance, or the US in the 70s were against nuclear power and radiation. Well, you cannot see it, but it's a very material thing, isn't it, that kills you rapidly. And, and uh, Rachel Carson had written the book about, about pesticides, isn't it? And DDT. So this is also a very material substance. So to call environmental movements post-materialist, well, I said it was a terrible misnomer, I used this word, in, in this book, saying, no, what happens is that many young, many poor people, before they are dispossessed at the commodity frontiers, or they are polluted in cities because they are poor and they cannot complain easily or because they are black people in the states or indigenous people elsewhere they cannot complain but they cannot face the companies but they can sometimes complain this does not mean that all poor people are environmentalists which is totally untrue it means that when there is a conflict people on the receiving end of the conflict tend to be poor people. They are not the, the companies, isn't they? they are not the rich people, and they complain. This was the theory of the environmentalists of the poor, born in the Himalayas, the idea from the Chipko movement, from the Delta Niger, from the killing of Kemsara Weaver and eight or ten people by the military dictatorship and the Shell Company as more or less an accomplice for oil, and so many examples in Latin America, like Chico Mendes in 88, in, the, in, the, in Acre, in Brazil, defending the forest against uh, deforestation by cattle ranchers, isn't it? The whole area is now deforested of, of Shapuri in Acre. So this was the environmentalism of the poor. And now, 20 years afterwards, well, I would call in the book, I call it all the time the environmentalists of the poor and the indigenous, because we, the indigenous are not poor, they are poor in money terms, but they are not poor because they use nature in a different, as they please, they are being dispossessed, isn't it? And then I don't know exactly how to, that's why I put all this. Downtrodden, some people reading Gramsci call them the subaltern, although Gramsci didn't talk about this. The, and also the sadists in France, which are people like in the Nantes airport, and I make a little joke about the sadists and the zapatists, mm -hmm. and then the nazis, which I wouldn't use because this comes from Eduardo Galeano and it's very <laughs> Latin America, but I read this a few days ago from Nancy Fraser, I think, that she uses the nazis or the nazis from Eduardo Galeano. So who are the protagonists of the second contradiction of capitalists, which is a new idea I bring here, the second contradiction of capitalists will be explained tomorrow by, by, by Zera Yassin, who is here perhaps in a class or in a lecture. It comes from James O'Connor in 88, is trying to do uh, ecological Marxism, isn't it? So there is a first contradiction of 
excessive investment and lack of buying power by the exploited labor. And there is the second contradiction, which is something he said, that the growth of capitalism was polluting the people, and the people, some people were complaining in the environmental justice movement in this sense. This was in 88, and it was a personal friend of him, and so I bring this as an explanation. Plus the issue of, uh, of, uh, of languages of evaluation. And this is the last thing which I wrote yesterday in honor, <coughs> in honor of J Jason Kegel, who just left, uh, but George Kallis is still here uh, because he cannot leave because he's sorting the last, <laughs> yes, no room to leave, to put it through the window. But uh, there is no reason for this. Jason Kicker had a class now, he told me. So, because very recently they got this uh, big European grant for, uh, they don't call it the growth, because they thought perhaps somebody in the ERC would uh, like the world, I don't know the reason. And they call it post growth, and the uh, project is called Real, and it's a 10 billion synergy project. So this is very good news for all of us in ITA and the university. What? what? Million, no billion. Billion. I said billion. Billion. I was in Colombia. I was thinking about Colombian pesos. <laughs> so first the critique, which is in the book actually, unless I take it up before publication. The relatively small growth movement in Europe and the US is rather solipsistic. I use this objective meaning, uh, doctrine in metaphysics in medieval times, saying that you only believe in your own existence, which is better than no belief in anybody's existence. Isn't it? Yes. That's what solipsistic means. Although it is inspired by George Reagan and Latouche, who were very universal. Uh, Latouche was an anthropologist in Africa economic anthropologist. And this movement of the growth, of course I've been a member, emphasizes uh, new public policies clearly, and also social movements without this kind of European small scale things, isn't it? Uh, it sympathizes, the other day I was in, in Cali, in Colombia, talking with Arturo Escobar on my side. And he talked about myself and I said, I, I am a vulgar materialist about commodities, energy flows, material flows. And he joked and said, I am a, 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 a vulgar materialist. And he said, I am a vulgar idealist. <laughs> because he believes in culture and words, the power of words, isn't it? And he was trained by Foucault himself in Berkeley. That's the origin of Arturo Escobar. So these are all little jokes, but I mean, it's true that I believe more in realities. And all these words, I'm not impressed too much by these words. Because I know Buen Vivir, who it came from, from Sarayaco in Ecuador. And of course, it's very old, Summa Causae, perhaps 3,000 years, 4,000 years, nobody wrote it. But it might be older than Aristotle. In, in Quechua, isn't it? Summa causa. But uh, these are words, after all, and perhaps there are some realities. And in fact, George Scalis, because I've been influenced by what George wrote some years ago, he said, because we had this polemic about the growth and environmental justice. And Beatriz Rodriguez wrote a book, saying, I have talked to people in the usual project from Latin America, Nigeria, India, and they don't, activists, they don't like the word degrowth, isn't it? So, which you would agree with this, isn't it? You even, Rodan Morel wrote something quite similar. So we have been struggling with this. There is an alliance, a potential alliance, and George just wrote this. He wrote that there are natural allies, uh, these movements in the South, and those indigenous groups and so on. And also Hegel, who just left the room, wrote, because he's from South Africa, so he's a bit more radical on these issues, I think. It's not just a critique of exchange in the global north, it is also a critique of commodification, unequal trade, 
the growth rejects the cheapening of labor and resources and races in the South. So the growth for Jason here is about decolonization. I think this is going, should be taken very, very seriously because this is the kind of, of, of uh, background or the foundation we need to think on an alliance between steady growth, as Herman Daly said, or degrowth or post-growth, they are all more or less the same thing, in the north, because it doesn't sell well in the south, or not yet, or cannot, with the real movement in the south complaining against this, uh, what is happening, isn't it? And this is the last one. The growth in practice, I have never discussed this with George, but I think he wrote the growth in practice and three or four lines in one of his books. The growth in practice, so it's not the growth saying the word the growth, it's the growth in practice, means uh, to stop extractive industries, stop with dumping, and so on. It also, of course, links with some ideas perhaps Ubuntu and perhaps this book called Pluriverse, which was born in Barcelona, edited by Federico, Arturo Escobar, Alberto Acosta, Ariel Chalet, and, uh, and Cisco Tari as the main editor from India, is really doing very well. I was very skeptical, I thought these are words, they are, they are really uh, uh, material, not material, vulgar material, they are vulgar, vulgar idealists, isn't it? Not vulgar, but I mean, they are trying to show that words have power, which is true sometimes. But uh, apart from this, there are facts, isn't it? Like stopping minds and so on. And all the movement called the LFFU, Living Fossil Fuels Underground and so on. So this is what I mean. Sometimes, and the last point is that sometimes, and some of us have written, I think, uh, <coughs> Senya Hanasik, who is here, another uh, woman in the world, they wrote a book saying, uh, The Growth from the Margins, isn't it? Is this the title of the article? The Growth from the Margins. Yes. So it was from Women Care Economics, of course, the margins, and from the South, isn't it? With Rototi Roy. Well, my point is that this is the margins, socially, but it's not the margins, this is the center of the real economy, care, and the center of the currents of trade in tons and jewels, isn't it? We, as Hickel has shown, and also Juan Infante Amate with this 120 years of terms of trade of Latin America, this fantastic article, published by Urrego and Infante Amate and Rick Tello and somebody else, Pinheiro, in Global Environmental Change, we can show, we know, that the, the current of material trade from the south to the north, it has been going on more and more as we see now. So, that's the end. Thank you. The book is not published, so it's a bit early to read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Now is it, you are going to discuss this. Well, I'm not really interested. No? <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I'm supposed to moderate, but at the same time, give some comments. So I have some uh, kind of conflict of interest. But, uh, but I will give a, a seminar, and we can continue this discussion the, the 14th of uh, November, right? in Monday, so, uh, because uh, it's quite interesting what you said about India Heart and what kind of coalitions we can make with the so-called Global South, the word that I, I don't like much, like indigenous people, it seems like it's a word invented in the North to refer to people in other parts of the world, <laughs> and uh, uh, so I'm, I don't know what I really am, I'm supposed to be from the Global South, but from European origin, so I'm a bit confused. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
I think that the point is it's not how to get alliances with uh, with social movement dealing with uh, with ex extraction frontiers because it's, that's relatively easy. The the challenge the challenge is how to get. I mean, it's relatively easy to get a, an alliance with uh, our social class and it's a well educated white social class. Yeah? with uh, uh, you know more or less of black people affected by dams or mining uh, because there is a common interest what is really challenging, challenging is to get an alliance with the black women in the favela that votes for Bolsonaro yeah. that's what the challenge is because this, these are the people who are deciding for, the, for example the future of, of Brazil and uh, the main point I want to discuss and then, I also have a discussion with you is that the war is not the best narrative, it is not the best strategy to communicate with those people. It might be a nice word for communicating with people living with social rural st struggles that with people tending to be conservative in the, in, in the peripheries of the cities or even in rural areas is not a nice word because it's associated with it seems like something that is really far away. Uh, but I have prepared some words that before I have realized today that John's knowledge and memory is like cumulative and linear, like CO2 in the, the atmosphere. <laughs> so he's much wiser now than I, when I met him. About <laughs> twice, or, or three times more. And, uh, so it's a bit of a challenge because he, he keeps each the same. So for kind of metabolic analysis, it's a bit diffi difficult to uh, assess kind of knowledge and information and how it relates to, to, to uh, material inputs because he's, he's, uh, he's in good shape, so he's not eating more. And <laughs> but he's becoming wiser and wiser. And it's, it's relatively the same in terms of information for, for our economy. Right? But, uh, well, I, I have prepared some words for. Uh, so, for me, I, uh, first of all, I want to say that I feel really at home here. Uh, this university is very important for me. And uh, it, it is always like emotional experience to come to, to Barcelona. I mean, from the smell of the, of the, of the streets, which is, I don't know why, but Barcelona has a very particular smell. Uh, that people are well born here probably do not realize it, but for those who come from abroad, uh, the only difference is that it smells more to uh, more marijuana now. I don't know why. I have to explain it. But uh, to the members of friendship, love, uh, food, and knowledge, uh, everything here is charged with a uh, sense that they have lived uh, one of the best periods of my life in this in this university and this city. So thanks for that. And I'm part of the, the first cohort of the students of the Doctor of Rome in Environmental Sciences which was created back in 1997 where Jesus had black hair <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jesus uh, and uh, my Nazi came a bit later, one year later but Jesus, Jesus was, 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 was rector of the uh, Universidad Regional Amazonica in uh, Iquia in Ecuador and now he, he was a recent promotion and he became professor here and, uh, <laughs> And uh, Pan de Paco who, who, who was a uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador and Minister of Planning, so the, he was the first ecological economist to became Minister of Foreign Affairs, he was part of the same group, so uh, very nice group. And, um, and, and, and we came to this university when ICTA only existed in paper. I mean, there was something that was called ICTA, but it was a kind of bureaucratic invention, uh, kind of narrative. Uh, uh, once I remember that at that time, it was idealist. But uh, <laughs> at that time, um, it shocked me because uh, I, uh, I remember thinking, what, what, where did I came here? I mean, infrastructure was very precarious. I don't know if you remember, but uh, uh, we had to, to queue in the library to check emails. And uh, we had to spend several hours just 
waiting for the emails to open, and then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, of course, in, in, internet was very uh, incipient at the time. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but there was a time where there were no cell phones, and Jesus and I are part of this generation who live this transition to, to cell phones. And, uh, and I now I come back, I mean, like a, more than 25 years later, and um, to happily launch this, this book. So thanks for, for the invitation um, to uh, uh, Sergio and Ita. And, um, and then in the meanwhile, uh, uh, Ita has become one of the most um, influential and important centers of research in sustainability sciences in, in Europe and probably the world. And, uh, you know, and more specifically in the fields of ecological economics and political ecology. So what a, what a really remarkable change from, from narrative, from, from Bureaucratic invention to you know uh, material uh, a material existence the, which is really influencing a lot of people um, and the origin of what we call the, the Barcelona School of Ecological Economics and Political Ecology can be traced back to the foundation of ecological economics as an international academic society in a meeting that was hosted by Joan here in Barcelona as well in 1987. Uh, the year that some of you were born, or not even born. And, uh, and I'm currently president of the International Society for Ecological Economics, so somehow I feel part of this flow, intergenerational flow. Um, and this position was held by John some years ago. Um, so after several generations, we are here for celebrating the, the consolidation of academy schools. So, um, I, I was quite impressed by, by his presentation and um, no words about the, the, the amount of knowledge and, and information that has been accumulated during these years. But yeah, I think his contribution goes much beyond um, knowledge and, and information. And I see that he collects like two conflicts per day or something like that. Or, uh, <laughs> they have been collecting conflicts for, during the last 50 years or so. So, and now we have this book, which is, uh, has been a very nice and hard experience. And this, I will not talk about the content of the book, I just, I would like to, to say that it has 33 chapters, so it's more an encyclopedia than a book. And, <laughs> and it has uh, 56 authors, many of them are here. I would like to thank all of them for participating. And it has also a, pre uh, a preface of, of Herman Daly, who recently passed away, so it's also an homage to, to him. And I would like to thank uh, some people, uh, first of all, Federico Di, uh, Di Maria, who it was his idea initially, <laughs> but unfortunately he, he got a position, he was too, was too busy to, to take it, and he passed uh, to, to us. And to Sergio, of course, he has a lot, a lot of time to it. Thanks for the patience. And uh, mutually, because uh, I have been also patient with you, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to me. <laughs> uh, and of course, I would like to thank Ita because he, Ita was key in this process, because with the support of uh, Esteva uh, and, the, and the committee evaluating this book, I mean, it was uh, funded, and now it's going to be open access. You see that it says there somewhere, open access, which is extremely important uh, for the rest of the world uh, that people that we can disseminate these ideas and of course it was uh, part of the Maria, Maria de Maeciu uh, grant and all, uh, Sergio also got an uh, autonomous solidarity grant uh, to, to launch the book and, to, and to probably to translate it to, to Spanish. So my last words, I would like to say that an academic school is composed of a network of people that share a common understanding of a particular field um, and the same references. Um, the people that compose the network interact through a variety of relations, including collaboration, admiration, uh, synergy, complementarity, and of course, as you know well, also competition, hate, and, and, and conflict. <laughs> right? Uh, so, and, and there are some people that study networks, and they, they call it expert, uh, experts in network analysis. They refer to the creation of a concept that's called centrality. Mm -hmm. 
as the level of importance a particular node uh, has in relation to other nodes of the network. Um, so it's a node in the network that is particularly important. Uh, so and in, the, in the network of the Barcelona School of, of Ecological Economics and Political Ecology, Joan represents the node with the largest degree of centrality. That is, the node through which all the other nodes connect with each other. Um, so we can therefore now confidently say that beyond his own very significant contribution to the fields um, that were presented here, Joanna has also succeeded in creating a, a school by means of building bridges between, uh, between these two fields, ecological economics and, and ecological economics. And this means not only establishing uh, analytical linkages between, between concepts and approaches, but also a more importantly, creating linkages connecting people. So through our work and interactions, we are weaving a tissue form that all of us that consider ourselves part of this school. Bueno, voy a pasar español para terminar. Bueno, Vinicius de Moraes, que es un poeta brasileño muy conocido, decía que la, que la vida es el arte del encuentro y bueno, yo creo que tenía, tenía razón ¿no? la vida no es sino ese interminable flujo de vínculos ¿no? que se, queje, se tejen y destejen eh, en el tiempo e inclusive más allá de nuestra propia muerte y por medio, por medio de una memoria compartida y estamos aquí eh, celebrando la vida ¿no? y obra de, de una persona que ha, te, que ha tenido la fortuna queriéndolo o no de ser el elemento común que nos une aquí y ahora y que por lo tanto, espero yo, será siempre recordado de una manera u otra como parte importante de nuestras vidas por cada uno de nosotros. Gracias. Señor. Dictionary, the Dictionary of the Gross, edited by Giorgio, uh, Giacomo Marisa, and Federico Maria. One of the chapters, the main chapters in the very successful book, is about commodity frontiers. So they are two at the time, young uh, postdocs, or not even postdocs, to write the chapter, and they start the chapter saying, Would we live in the Barcelona School of Ecological Economics? That's uh, such and such thing. So I got very surprised. And then, so thank you to you because you have this good, but uh, no, I think it's a good idea of calling ourselves the Barcelona School. This was the origin. I don't know whether it's in the preface to the book, but should be. And apart from this, I also this morning was thinking, is this offensive to anybody apart from the other performance school? In ICTA, because ICTA is much more than this part of it. So I could say, as in the school, it was in the environmental anthropology, whatever you go, right? For yourself and the industrial ecologists which are very close to the metabolism and other people, the, the, the oceanographers and uh, so it takes much more than this and we should remember it and here and the people who have died recently like Tony Hussein and Garcia Orellana, quite young, Garcia Orellana and how it goes on through a secret. Some people prefer to know it exists not only because of the building and the length of another and new person that we have helped to build together with the, with the people who work in manual in this great service. But also because <coughs> uh, it, it takes grow because of the enthusiasm of professors of this university who we started the, the study of environmental sciences in 92 from which it grew up, 
without asking anybody, in fact, with got permission, and with the support, some support from the university. And then also, I think, from the ICREA professors, so we have to say ICREA, and from the European funds, and the Maria de la Maestra, which is a candidate. One thing, at the end, at ICREA, because I know some people who are young, or less than 40, which is not so young anymore, and think, how can we belong to it, and so on. If they just get a great job, which is a good job, I am not sure it's a good job. That we cannot select the people one by one. The CREA professors also a different selection. And the ERCs, you know how they are, they are like a, a lottery, not a relax, with some a weighted lottery. And, and therefore, we cannot do this ourselves in the time. And this has saved us a lot of conflicts about who to call here yeah, as university departments usually get which are a hell of an institution for this kind of selection of people. And so thanks to ICREA, I think, and thanks to the European Money, and thanks to the founders, but Marie, Devot, Lenkov, uh, Saudi, all these university professors who didn't like the departments where they were, and we joined to go. Rosa Rodina. Three kids. Three kids. Three kids. Well, the work that exists then is so, thank you very much, because this is just one part of it. That's a wonderful thing. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we, we have spent all the time, we have a story about it. So, but you join us here, you can ask some questions afterwards. Do you want to discuss it? Yeah. Why? You don't mind that? Yeah. I got any complaints. I mean, I think we can discuss No, because he wants to cut it, then I say that yeah. he wants to. Yeah, I have a bunch of side. That's it. No, okay. This is your agreement. You want to agree? I'm really happy to open it up. How we can get this? No, so the book is just a final, really final. This time is true. <laughs> <Final. laughs> <laughs> uh, final phase uh, of production. So uh, I hope that in uh, <laughs> two months, one and a half more month, it will be available online. So since open has access, everybody will get access to it. And you don't, yeah, you don't have to to cut trees to pay to to print the, the book. Yeah. Let, let's collect a couple of questions. Yeah, maybe three, four questions, and then John can. Yeah. I mean, more. Well, yeah. I guess your question. So, John, I wanted to ask about the title because you explained the making of the world the second part, right? And the title of the book is Land, Water, Air, Freedom. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Yeah. So the the so freedom the freedom concept you didn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, you didn't, it's not explicit, but it's probably implicit. Okay. The, the title is Land. What an air and freedom and explain why that we do. And the subtitle I was doubting between the making of the world movement or the world movements in plural and it is more important to put world movements because of and the title land water and freedom comes from Tierra Libertad or from Croatian, how do you say this? In Russian, Senia. So, Sendia Doria in Russian, more or less, and it comes from the 19th century. The popular is the peasant movement, with Lavrov and so on. And it came here with the anarchists, it was a German called Tierra Libertad, went to Mexico to Zapata, but before Zapata, Flores Magón. And I like, yeah, I, I mean, I hope anybody buying the book or reviewing the book will notice that this is an anarchist slogan adding water and air. That's the only thing. But yeah, but do we have conceptualized like the freedom component? Because Tierra and Libertad went together. Mm -hmm. And it's now, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know if it's going to be a set, but it's in the Spanish translation, 
So, I think a technical, the question is just about political power. It's not that I want to have an internalization of externalities, for instance, I think it's a question. Yes, how was your dad internalized? Oh, good economic, good environmental problems. What could make a competition? Ways to spoil the title. <laughs> no, no, I, mean, I guess my point is that uh, it seems so maybe too evident for you, but maybe uh, the, the, the link of the theory, is, I mean, is, I don't think it's that evident. I'm not going to explain it in the book. It's for the okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So we have some questions here? Yes. I like that you connected the two elements of your work, the entropy, and environmental conflict and refer to just to just a ribbon. It was interesting. I was once suggested by a journal to make a link in a paper to the limits to growth, because at the time it was 45 years old, now it's 50, and the limits to growth is published. And they also devote explicit attention to CO2 emissions, climate change, and global warming. So uh, I wonder if you're just a ribbon. No, so I, think, just by I, that. I don't think the test oh, was the first one. No, no, no. But this, that I should look at this. If you can see it. Yeah, I can send it. Yeah. But what I want to say is that does the fact that entropy is something that comes forth, the increase in entropy, does that mean bad news for environmental conflicts? And then also given that we have a, a big world with many people who like to use goods that all require extracted However, you see yeah, the future. Yeah, this is discussed. It's not just immediate, isn't it? But well, the point of entropy is that life is negative entropic, as certain as said, and just escorated in the times, and Felix Auerbach in, in Vienna already and contends that this word ectropismo. So this is my first book of ecological economics. And now people are working on this kind of archaeology of the years from ecological economics and then like Diana Franco in the sample. And a lot of people in Central Europe typing about this and shedding a concern. So what life is anti entropic more or less, because you end by dying. And, and uh, but the point is that since we're based on fossil fuels, with plastic in the energy system. So there is no way of making it circular. You couldn't recycle it. This is what I learned from the Descorrera, but you could say it was already invented, everybody knew this, but nobody has said with the strength that he said. And therefore, because of this, there is a need to fetch new sources, new coal, oil, <coughs> and gas, or whatever, nuclear energy, biomass energy, from the commodity extraction from fears who comes from this and more and from Pakistan before, or if not with the same words, uh, to run the economy. Then, from the waste side, CO2 is a coincidence of the chemistry of carbon and oxygen and the greenhouse effect. Could we have been different? I know enough about that history of physics of the world, but it's bad luck, isn't it? It's precisely what comes in or out as carbon dioxide and produces an excessive amount not absorbed by the plants and so on. So before, this, is, um, this was not from Arrhenius or even before, and it's something that we know now that is um, so there is no question. And then the attempts now to correct the greenhouse effect and increase the it helps prevent peak oil, which is a different issue, whether it's peak oil or not, uh, means that we are looking for new types forms of energy. Uh, and these forms of energy, like electrical energy, require new materials. So now there is a passion, which I consider to be excessive in our world, but, but which other people are very fond of doing, of looking at windmills as a new form of conflict, <coughs> also solar panels, for instance, in Mexico, people complain because of the land that is needed for this. Or nickel, or palladium, or all these metals. 
mejores son en el señor Sergio Tour, The Young Table, y es ahora coming into the economy. Es una And en la forma de New Zealand. Esos conflictos arisen all the time from the changes in the social economies. And they cannot be just solved the same way, internalized externalities, which are much of bad government, but you can say it's But it's in the particular being here, you can talk about the law, playing the field, you know, playing some kind of history. So we internalize externalities or we include the government. There are lots of countries around the world with a considerable amount of getting killed in this kind of countries. And this comes from a vulgar materialist position, which is a kind of joke that I don't know about myself, from all the people who are not these capitalists. This is what we discussed in, in colonialism. Who is neoliberalism? I don't know whether the idea was talking about this. I don't think it's neoliberalism. I don't think it would be the same social democratic agencies if that industry is the same. And it would be the same with not for it, so to speak, if a Stalinist economy would dominate the new world. Or if the Chinese economy, which is quite likely, keeps on dominating the rest of the world. And what is China in political science? So there are several questions. Field communism. Field communism. Field communism. What? Field communism. 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 Latin American context about the commodities, where the commodities are so important for the, for the global market and uh, many things that you showed before, and, and feed so many land and water conflicts of the protection like grabbing and what else. And you, but, but in your last slide, you show about uh, the how some kind of movement uh, could maybe. Uh, uh, Some move, movement are resurging in this context, uh, but sometimes I saw that uh, many companies maybe appropriated some technologies, some things, and just put uh, makeup and call it by ESG, for example, and how we can uh, maybe avoid this type of this thing because maybe these scenarios, this situation uh, just uh, accumulated or uh, more injustice or more inequalities and uh, yeah and then the, then the, on the other hand we have the, the discussion about intensification and technique but how we can maybe balance it, these things and uh, yes yeah. it's wonderful thank you so much but the, the point about the growth and environment yes. I think we have discussed this we are discussing this still but there is no and more things will be written and, and it's not that people doing the growth which I have jokingly called solipsistic are really solipsistic uh, in a variety way I mean, it's a passing stage in their life uh, and they are not I mean, there are people concerned about the whole world but you cannot start when you are young I didn't know anything about India when I was even 45 years old, the first time I went to Southeast. And there's no time in one life to know about the whole world, but like 45 years old. The other point I would like to make is what is said that these women, black women in the favelas or even in the countryside in, in Brazil, as so many other people, see a company coming and they should have to get some money. We are going to fight against, but when we lose, we will 
on the income and so the several valuation languages are deployed and quite often things are <coughs> going to overhead. An extraction takes place in this, or some contamination is solved by some new technologies. So I'm not saying that there is a, the only thing in the world are these movements. What is going on in the world is economic growth is still in places based on this kind of extraction and pollution, sometimes helped by some measure of ecological modernization. And efficiency in the other things. The the but there is like um, what well, I said before a majority, but there is for the social movement you need some people to be in the social movement, you need everybody to be in the social movement. For instance, you will hear the Catalan social movement, well, you really almost became independent, see you for that, uh, but never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What you say is, <laughs> not yet, but we don't need 99% or 10% we need a certain amount of people to be in this precarious about impulse, but we don't need everybody to be in the environmental movement for things to change. We need some people, and people are in the, not because of their ideas, or they also of course use their ideas and their terms and their terminology that change. Prince Jacob was not outside came to the Dutay family and Patricia Walinda, I know these people in Ecuador came into the constitution through Alberto Acosta. These people had stopped an uh, oil company in Sarayaco, a small community in the Amazon Cross, and Carlos Viteri, who became minister with Correa because he wrote a thesis in the Salesian University, which is for Indians, for indigenous people. A, a, a thesis three or four years before on what Mark Kausai meant. And this is how it happened. I, have no, I cannot replicate this philological kind of discussion for Ubuntu or for other terms in the pluriverse movement. Uh, and I have no doubt that all the very legitimate uh, sort of, of philological uh, history is in place. So, but here the word. The world is very old because it just needs a good life in future. But uh, the political views came with uh, the constitutional code of 2088. And it came from this local fight in Sarajevo. They, they went to the, to the American Court for Human Rights and they won against this company and against the state because they had read the company had seismic exploration and making explosions to check whether there was oil. Many people are still, some people from the color agree with this. So that's why I believe more in this. So it's not that everybody, there are many places in the world itself where the local resistance has been overcome. Or did not exist. Mr. Yako, who is a physicist, not to be that young, and not sure, which I examined, it didn't like it, but she was saying the truth. He said, in the Napo Lower River Valley, where the Asumi ITT, which becomes so important in my life also, the Asumi ITT initiative in Ecuador, the Warani probably went against all experience. The non contacted people will know. <laughs> and, uh, Quechua people settled, settled some 500 years at the Napo River, they were all in favor of Korea and the Indian which is not an But uh, this was the situation, we don't know at the time, actually. I would have doubted it, but she spent uh, six months living there as an anthropologist. Julie Dayong, interesting. Wait, correct. Two more questions? Muy bien, voy a permitirme hablar en español. Yo vengo de México, la tierra de zapatos y del zapatismo. Y en México estamos viviendo pues una crisis totalmente desde Green para acá, han matado a dos activistas más, eh, defensores del territorio. Se ha convertido en el país más peligroso para hacer este, la defensa del territorio. Y a mí me preocupa mucho eh, lo que está pasando, incluso que desde aquí tiene que ver con lo mismo. 
mi pregunta es ¿cómo desde la Universidad de Barcelona desde esta propuesta o cómo podemos hacer vínculos que tengan un efecto en los territorios o con los movimientos de base que estamos en resistencia contra los megaproyectos Gracias. ¿En qué parte de México? Zacatecas. Bueno, no puede, pero aquí no podemos hacer mucho. ¿no? Creo que no. el Aldas ayuda un poco a la difusión. ¿no? Por ejemplo, en Puebla hay casos que nos cuesta. La niña de Irene que está aquí. Habla con ella después. Sí. Que ya los conocemos. Pero es al revés. Es al revés. Yo mismo. He aprendido mucho en México, he aprendido en Colombia, últimamente hace una semana estuve en Quito, en un congreso de ecología política, organizado por acción ecológica, sobre todo en Andina, en la FAPSO, el congreso lo toma de ecología política. Yo estaba así, me explican por qué el centro no puede interesarse, pero no está muy alto en Quito. Es igual, me trataron con mucho cariño y respeto, pero si tomaron el congreso, unas feministas indígenas comunitaristas de una, bueno, no sé, vamos a dejarlo en mal de Bolivia, que no queremos que hablen más los hombres de la sala, vamos a hablar nosotras, indígenas del Putumayo, en Putumayo o sea, en pueblo inca del Putumayo de Colombia, no sé qué existía, no en el pecho, y todos de acuerdo en la plaza organizar una performance de último día para que los demás nos callaran. Es muy instructivo, pero aquí la lógica. Darío está Darío Escobar. Siempre se puede generarlo. Cuando más deja. Es que Darío Escobar, que es un lógico de nosotros, ¿no? Y el doctorado aquí también, él está en Zacatecas. Es en Zacatecas, en Darío Escobar, con el círculo. Pero eso es feminista, y, y que no eran ecofeministas, que la palabra ecología política era occidental, no, sino que no, sino, no, no era el realismo, sino de cómo el mundo se mueve, se mueve más en América del Sur que la mente que la gente. Ahora sí, sí. No, yo me quedé con la cuenta, no, se ubica un poco, usan patriarcado, ¿no? El patriarcado que es griego o latín, porque no estoy seguro. O sea, que es muy difícil hablar sin palabras occidentales cuando hablas en castellano. Sí. Ahora, que he hecho la que no se puede hablar. Todo esto existe en la mente de la O sea, júntate con ellos. Muy bien, se lo Me voy a comer. Sí. Olvídate de los libros en inglés. Me preguntaba si ahora que finalmente le hemos puesto un nombre a esta escuela eh, de, de Barcelona, la realidad ya no es más de Barcelona. Después de 25 años de. A ver, se encuentra en su No, es algo curioso, ¿no? Es algo Viene de su Mira, después de 25 años de Joat se ha funcionado como un punto de gravedad a una diversidad de, de contribuciones de la. De, de la eso ya el metabolismo del, del, del feminismo, de los movimientos sociales, también se ha vuelto un punto de dispersión de estas ideas. Hoy en día lo que llamamos la escuela de Barcelona, no es más de Barcelona, está, está en Perú, está en Colombia, está en Ecuador, está en Argentina, está en la India. Entonces me pregunto si el paso siguiente no sería realmente, y, y, y como bien explicaba Joan, el ICTA ya no es un activo por sus limitaciones de de tipo institucional, lo que fuera es un espacio limitado para contener toda esa riqueza global que tal vez nació en parte en Barcelona, nutrido por muchas otras formas de conocimiento y disciplinas y experiencias, pero hoy en día también no habría que pensar en algo como un instituto global de ecología, ecológica de económica, política de ecología y global de economía justice, o algo que permita generar un espacio que todavía no tenemos en donde tú tu rotante de Brasil o la gente que hay en este momento trabajando en esto en Colombia y en muchos sitios del mundo, desde diferentes formas de, de diferentes universidades, también populares, o así pues un espacio global para pensar lo que estamos hablando. Ya no es más Barcelona, ya no es más ICTA, y el ICTA está siendo un espacio limitado también porque no nos permite institucionalizar esta escuela. Estamos limitados por 
los procesos de ICREA, los procesos de proyecto, ya es más que lista. Gracias a Joan y, y como Joan ha logrado crear esta constelación de, de, de personas, activistas, académicos. Por lo cual me pregunto si no voy aquí, ahora que ya eh, pongamos el nombre, pero ese nombre ya es Autete, estamos hablando de... Está <risa> bien, cuando ponemos nombres a las cosas, pero que ya... Yo creo que lo haces tú,